uh, while innovations in information and communication technology have significant potential to benefit patients, these also raise ethical challenges, which if not addressed well, would weaken the patient-physician relationship. Here comes the responsibility of the stakeholders to facilitate the ethical practice of telemedicine or telehealth. Yeah. So what do you understand by stakeholder? Now, stakeholder is any person or a party or an organization that regulates telehealth care, that provides telehealth care, that look in, looks into the payment for delivering the telehealth care, or a person who, in fact, receives the telehealth care. Now, when you talk about the stakeholders, stakeholders involved in provisioning and delivery of telehealth services can be broadly grouped into four groups. You can call these four Ps. Now, P1 is policymaker. So policymaker or regulators are the government or the government agencies. The second P is the provider. He or she may be a healthcare provider, a technology provider, or a health institution or a hospital. Now, third P is the payer, either re reimbursement by a insurance company by an insurance company on an employer, or if none are available for payment, then individual. And the last P is the patient who, in fact, is the ultimate receiver of the service, telehealth service, or you may call them as customers, where they pay for receiving the service. Now, let's come to the responsibility of the policymakers. Now, when you talk of the policymakers or the regulators, now we think that making legislation or preparing guidelines for effective delivery of telehealth care is the job of the government or government agencies. Now, in this country, the telemedicine practice like guidelines were notified by government last year in March. Hardly there was any time for bringing a legislation for that. So the government, because looking into the COVID-19 pandemic crisis, notified the guidelines which were rapidly accepted by many healthcare professionals. So it is now perfectly legal in India to provide teleconsultation by registered medical practitioners, MBBS or above, in line with the requirements of the telemedicine practice guidelines already notified by the government. Now, when you talk of the telemedicine practice guidelines, what does it provide? When you think of the role of the providers, now this provides that the norms and protocols relating to the physician-patient relationship, which are to be followed by the healthcare professional. Second is it provides a broad outline on the issues of liability and negligence. Thirdly, it looks into the evaluation, how a medical practitioner will evaluate, manage, and treat a patient over a virtual platform. And what are the methods of obtaining consent, whether it is a implied consent, whether it is informed consent or explicit consent, uh, when the situation, depending upon the situation in which a consultation is being offered. Then also it uh, lays emphasis on the privacy and security of patient records, which has been discussed by my previous speakers. And finally, it also looks into the scope of reimbursement and the health education. Now, National Medical Commission in India has been functioning. This formation of this was notified in Gazette in, on 24th of September 2020. And from next day, that is 25th of September, National Medical Commission started functioning with an aim to enforce high ethical standards in all aspects of medical services, 
including telemedicine services. Now that is that was about the uh, regulators or the policy makers. Now next is the responsibility of another stakeholder that means the medical professional. So here comes the role of the key stakeholder that is the medical practitioner. So even if we adopt new technologies and new models to deliver medical care, but we must remember that physicians fundamental ethical responsibility do not change whether it is an in-person consultation or whether it is a consultation over a virtual platform. He or she is required to uphold the same professional and ethical norms and standards as applicable to traditional in-person in -person care, what is happening for centuries. Now next comes the fidelity or we call the faithfulness of a, to a person. Now, we should not forget that patients and their family members, they have always faith on the physician, on the medical practitioners. And the medical practitioners who offer the medical care from a distance, whether it is a virtual consultation or in-person consultation, it is required they have to place the interest of the patient over all other interests. That is always necessary and the patient has a hope that the physician will do that. Now, second is the, uh, the professional. What are the professional judgment? Now, when we talk about professional judgment, now it is necessary that the physician or the medical practitioners must determine what modality of care is best for a given patient. Now, if he is thinking of delivering or a consultation over a virtual platform, he should remember that if he is dealing with a patient of asthma, he doesn't know that either whether it is a case of cardiac asthma or a case of bronchial asthma. So it is difficult to offer a consultation unless you would know one from the other. A patient of cardiac asthma, which is other known as left ventricular failure, if not treated immediately, then patient may succumb, but not a patient of bronchial asthma unless he is in status. So in these situations, it is necessary that patient has to be examined in person to differentiate whether he is dealing a case of chronic bronchial asthma, acute bronchial asthma, or a patient of cardiac asthma. Similarly, if an emergency condition necessitates urgent care, the medical practitioner has to advise first aid to provide immediate relief and guide for referral of the patient. Now take for example, let's take for example of acute perforative peritonitis with dehydration. If a patient is there at a remote end with acute perforative peritonitis dehydration, then the medical practitioners has to look into the first aid in the form of administering intravenous fluids to correct the dehydration and then thinking of referring. So that is essential in all emergency conditions. Now, medical practitioner has to decide when to shift the patient for in-person care or to refer. So any patient who is, who is being offered teleconsultation and subsequently on telefollow-up, if develops a complication, he has to be, it is the responsibility of the medical practitioner to decide that this is as the time has come to shift or refer to a specialist which is staying nearby. Now, the privacy and confidential issues have been discussed in detail. Physicians who have who provide clinical service via telemedicine must protect the security and integrity of patient electronic data while receiving the data, while storing the data, and while transferring the data to other physicians or medical practitioners with whom he wants to share to come at a conclusion or to better plan the management of a particular patient and must ensure that the healthcare professionals also at the remote end with whom he is sharing the patient data interact with do also behave also likewise. They have to also restore the data in the way the primary physician is looking after.
they must ensure appropriate mechanism to prevent unauthorized access by third person now next is with continuity of care now physicians who provide clinical telehealth or telemedicine services must not abandon the patient and should possess the commitment to provide for continuity of care now this more this is more essential for non communicable diseases particularly for patients with orthopedic problems rheumatological problems diabetes hypertension uh, chronic kidney disease and so on and so forth where continuity of care is extremely essential also the patients of cancer who have been operated and subsequently on are on follow up now next is the the responsibility of the health institutions or the hospitals now we talk of the government hospitals the private hospitals now the hospitals should have some control over the medical practitioners it is essential always that the private hospitals who is possible have better control about the health practitioners than government hospitals so whatever may be the situation it is essential that the medical practitioners should not be allowed to insist on teleconsultation where patient's choice is for an in person consultation it is also the responsibility of the hospital to see that the medical experts do are not permitted to upload images and pictures of patients on social media a strict vigil is to be maintained to see that the medical practitioners do not prescribe drugs from the restricted lists and instructions to the medical practitioners has to be issued to see that they do not solicit patients for telemedicine through advertisement which has been discussed in detail by dr sunil srof now let's come to the responsibility of the payers now friends the insurance regulatory and development authority of india has directed insurers to ensure to include telemedicine to include telemedicine as part of medical consultation cover in health policies this was done after medical council of india issued telemedicine practice guidelines in march 2020 enabling doctors to provide telehealth care using uh, to uh, enabling doctors provide health care using telemedicine so hence all policy holders are now eligible to avail this facility as part of claim settlement policy so this is definitely a facility who is have been given to the patients but friends it is expected that the insurers would find ways and means in coming days to scrutinize better the claims so that some ethical aspect is enforced now as regards the responsibility of the employer when do not have the reimbursement facility by the insurer then it is the medical grants which are given by the employer indian organizations organizations are fast turning into telemedicine uh, uh, as part of their employee health programs after the irdai mandated health policies to cover telemedicine consultations but friends look at this that telemedicine provider uh, telemedicine provides employer short term savings so why short term savings because the reduced cost of telehealth care claims resulting from employees unnecessary trips to a doctor so earlier the employees were being referred to different hospitals uh, for which they used to claim the travel expenses so this can the employer can get rid of all this if the employees take the advantage of telehealth care but is it always should be enforced should the employers to do this always so can the employer ensure ethical telehealth practice while uh, looking into the savings that the uh, which goes to the uh, hospital administration then responsibility of the patient ethical issues in telemedicine implies a consideration of patient's benefit or loss in receiving telemedicine services and his or her right to choose the therapy and react to 
dissatisfactory, dissatisfactory services. That means the patient has the right to choose the physician and he has the right to withdraw treatment during the process of telefollow-up from any medical practitioner he is not or she is not satisfied with. So that is always there for benefit of the patient. The patient shall be responsible for accuracy of information shared by him. So it is essential whether the patient is sharing or a caregiver is sharing or a healthcare worker is sharing for the patient. Now the data has to be accurate, should be informative so that the medical practitioner can make a proper diagnosis or if required, we can ask for additional information, additional, additional tests, so that a proper diagnosis can be reached by the medical practitioner and proper treatment can be advised. So friends, to conclude, I would like to say that stakeholders have to play a critical role as regards facilitators to promote the ethical practice of telehealth. Ethical guidelines in telemedicine are expected to complement the quality of healthcare services and strengthen the doctor-patient relationship. Thank you all.